This is my workshop in Lambeth, um, on Lambeth Walk, which is very near the Imperial War Museum. And it's where I do all my work. Uh, it's not a very large space, but it has everything I need. Um, particularly these lights, for example, I can change the um, angle of the lighting at an instant, which really helps to see your work properly. And all the, um, all the lighting is daylight so you can see the colours properly, um, daylight frequencies. Um, this is the bench I made which is um, really nice solid oak and the beauty of it is that I can adjust the height like this electrically which um, means you can keep the work at the optimum place for you to work um, physically and also so you can see things properly. I generally make two to three instruments a year which isn't very much. And that is because the process I use is very involved, um, namely designing the arching shapes of the front and back on the computer and transferring this information onto the wood. At the moment in time, I'm making five instruments, which um, is unusual in itself, although they won't all be completed in the same year. And that is a cello, viola, and three different model violins. The cello model is um, a William Forster II, 1794. Um, the original um, was made very near to here in central London. Um, it's a lovely shape model, uh, really very curvy, lovely curved C's. And um, here on the back, you can see um, I've put all the numbers representing the heights uh, of the curves that I've designed on the computer. Uh, to be transferred into the wood. So that's not really <coughs> concerned with the outside shape here or the inside once it's hollowed. It'll be the line that bisects the two and making sure that is really perfect. Um, Elisa Weilerstein plays the, this uh, particular model um, and she's really worth checking out. The viola model is a Conta Vitale um, by Andrea Guarneri. Um, this one has got a lovely back on actually. You can see it's almost like water. It's a, what we call a slab cut back. Um, it gives a very particular type of effect. Um, this one has had some treatment to it already. You can see the neck is was fitted later and is untreated. Whereas the body has seen some sun. Um, it's not varnished but it's had some staining and um, a coating just to protect it from the varnish to stop the varnish penetrating too deeply and affect, affecting it acoustically. Uh, so the next thing for this will be another ground coat which um, contains lots of minerals that augment the refraction of the light as it goes through the varnish and also help acoustically. The first violin I'd like to show you is a Niccolò Amati. Stradivari was supposed to have been an apprentice in his workshop, so you get a rough idea of when he was around. Um, it's a beautiful model, it's the Allard. Um, it's very petite, quite narrow in the seas, um, a little bit shorter than a Strad, um, very curvaceous in the um, archings, and a, just a beautiful instrument. Uh, I really like it. I, I heard one played by the first violinist in the Lindsay Quartet and thought it sounded amazing. And um, yeah, I found it a really successful model. The next one I'd like to show you is um, a Guarneri del Gesù, nine, uh, 1743 model. It's the So Ray. Now I, I'm very... Um, into the playing of Itzhak Perlman and um, I love the sound he gets and he plays uh, a Guarneri that is this model and um, it's slightly unusual it's a very late model it's quite high in the arch um, and the F's are quite eccentric like in the later period of his work and this one's had some natural varnish put on it uh, clear varnish 
um, it's still got quite a bit more to go uh, with colour and then with antiquing. And this is the Strad model I'm making. It's um, it's the Swal, which is the Strad that it's at Pullman Plays, which came from Yehudi Menwin, so that's got a lovely pedigree. Um, it's quite, it's very slightly longer than usual. Um, gives a really lovely even tone. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased with that one. It's worth checking out. Um, it's at Pullman's. Uh, Sonaten and Partiden, where you hear both of these models being played. Just thought I would show um, this is an example of antiquing. Um, this one's been quite heavily antiqued in the sense that a lot of the colour coat has been removed and just have little bits in the corners. Um, antiquing varies immensely. Sometimes it can be very subtle, this one's quite extreme. And here's a, another extreme version where you can see where the varnish has come off on the area where it would be on your shoulder and um, things like beard marks and, and sweat marks. But actually usually I'd say um, the antique is more subtle than this um, normally. There are two processes that uh, distinguish my work from other makers. Uh, the first being the fact that I designed the arching on a computer rather than using templates just to describe the outside of the instrument. Because the computer allows me to look at not the out, just the outside or the inside of the arch, but the line that bisects the two, which represents the true structural shape of the arch. This diagram is one of six that I produce for both the front and the back of an instrument. This one is actually um, the Forster cello front. And this particular diagram represents the narrow point of the front. That means the narrowest point between the C's. And you can see it's half across section. Once I've decided the height of this arching, I then produce a catenary curve, this blue line, to build the arching shape around. Now catenary comes from the word catena, which is Italian for chain, and you can see the curve that a hanging chain makes, and it's believed this shape was used to help guide the hollowing of the plate. Well, ideally, you want this structural line to be in the middle of the wood, not on the inside or the outside. They would have used the chain hanging to guide them for the inside. But this middle line here represents exactly the structural shape of the arch. This red line here you can see is the line that bisects the outside orange line and the inside brown line. And it follows the catenary as long as possible until it blends into the fluting. The second process that distinguishes my work from other makers is the fact that I use light to decide how thick to make the front and back plate and therefore how stiff they are. Um, normally this is done using something like a dial caliper which measures the thickness and then the violin maker will flex the plates with their hands and decide if it's too stiff or not. Um, wood is very variable in density, so two parts of the same thickness might be actually quite different stiffnesses. But light shining through the plate will really show up these density variations. And if you get an even light uh, transparency through the wood, then you much more like to have an even flexibility. This is a cello front that I'm working on at the moment and um, it's mounted on a light panel so when the light shines through this wood um, it highlights the variation in density and if for example I wanted to get a very even flexibility over the whole plate I would try and get it 
and even transparency. In actual fact, there are areas that you don't want the same flexibility and you can actually um, use the light to guide you to see these areas as well. Like if you want a stiff area, it will be slightly darker. So if I drop the lights and um, remove some wood with this thumb plane, you can see what I mean. The beauty of this is I can see exactly what I'm doing and it gives a very accurate uh, representation of the flexibility. This is an old uh, violin back that I discarded a long time ago because um, I overdid the thicknessing. And you can see very clearly here where the wood is thin um, and especially here where it's gone too thin, it's very bright. Um, so normally now I work using this light um, but the room will be completely blackened and I can just remove wood and see exactly how um, how dense the uh, the remainder is by um, the luminosity. <laughs> 